Our next part here, we're going to talk about what the typical components are of these uh, lateral force resisting systems. So we just got done talking about the different kinds of vertical systems, brace frames, moment frames, or shear walls. All of those are examples of the vertical portion of the system, how, they, how we go up the height of the building. But how does the whole system uh, actually work from point of application of forces all the way to get to the vertical system? And that includes the diaphragm and collectors and struts. We're going to predominantly just focus on overall uh, types of behavior and the different kinds of diaphragms. And it's really not within the scope of this course to get into the collectors and struts um, in more complicated systems. You typically get into that in an earthquake engineering course or maybe a timber masonry type course. So the, the essence here is that, especially for wind, that these exterior uh, walls will act in a sense like, kind of like a sail. We've got the wind blowing sideways and somehow we have to then get transfer the effect of that, uh, those wind pressures over to some sort of vertical element and then takes it, the loads down to the foundation. In a typical house type of situation such as drawing here, these exterior walls would be typically the uh, act like shear walls and so we'd have the wind trying to shear the building, rack it over sideways, and then these walls, in essence, would then resist. And that would happen, of course, in uh, either direction. In your typical one-story strip mall type of situation, you would see something uh, fairly similar to this kind of uh, system. And the, then the question becomes, well, then how, how does this wind pressure and its effects get over to these lateral resisting elements? And the answer there is, essentially that the typically you will have like say in a uh, wood frame house that you'd have these wall studs that would act as vertical beams and so they would be supporting whatever the wall cladding is such as um, whether it's oriented strand board plywood um, if you've got window units that sort of thing these vertical studs then would take these lateral pressures and they would act like simply supported beams from the base up to the the ceiling height and just transfer then those pressures up into a point load that is along then what we would call this diaphragm. That's this whole big piece right here is our diaphragm. Usually horizontal. Every once in a while you do have some that are sloped, but they are basically a big horizontal piece. And on that diaphragm then when we transfer all these stud forces, even though they are in some sense technically a concentrated force, there's so many of them that we can represent it quite adequately as a line load or a distributed load. So this W there that's on there is just coming from effectively the tributary uh, load that goes up to that or down if there's a, a, a floor above down to this level. And then that diaphragm acts as a simply supported beam that then takes its effects over to the lap vertical resisting element. So notice, we're going to start with lateral pressures onto a vertical beam that then splits the load vertically. And then we have a simply supported diaphragm um, that will then take the load and transfer it horizontally over to the shear wall that then collects all that load and in this case, the shear wall, or this vertical element being a shear wall, will shear across to the side, becoming a more general parallelogram in its deformed shape and, and transfer the load down to the foundation. Now, of course, those ends don't have to be shear walls. They could instead be moment frames. They could be braced frames. Um, they would generally, in a house, of course, either be a wall or a simple braced frame. That'd be a fairly simple kind of system, but usually in a simple building, one-story building, these will be uh, shear type walls uh, as opposed to any other kinds of, of situations until you get into certain kind of commercial construction or the loads get high enough that you decide that you need to have something more structurally uh, robust. So uh, that's the basic kind of action that's happening there. And that's in a one-story building. Now if you have a multi-story building, then at each and every one of these floors, those floors usually serve and roof serve multiple purposes, not only for transferring gravity loads over to beams and columns and then get down to the ground, but they also, then each and every one of those floor levels and roof levels will also serve as a diaphragm. And just like the same way as the one-story example we provided before, that from 
floor level to floor level, then we treat the external part as a simply supported beam. Um, occasionally it's constructed as a continuous beam, but usually we model those external pieces as just simply supported, and then that will just transfer all of those pressures and then line loads into point loads right at the individual story levels. And we had shown you in an earlier um, model of our lateral resisting system whatever that might be, we're just represented as a stick and we'll put the foundation down here that then you end up with then concentrated forces at the floor load or floor level. Right Now you might get some other little uh, secondary effects such as this one represents a little cantilever that's up there, rather the parapet which is a can effectively a little cantilever so there might be a little bit of tiny uh, moment that's also applied to the uh, top of that uh, particular system. But the key here in the modeling is is that we're going to treat each uh, story, um, the external part, as a uh, simply supported beam to transfer the loads into the diaphragm level and then the diaphragm will then take things over to wherever the um, the vertical elements are. Now one other really crucial part about diaphragms is that uh, they're two basic classes, rigid versus flexible, and four um, sort of direct apparent names, or the names are direct and apparent to how they respond to the uh, forces. So a rigid diaphragm with these, now this is a plan view looking at the horizontal thing, and we've got two vertical elements coming out at you in the screen to the side that the diaphragm is now transferring forces over to, so your reactions to that simply supported beam would look something like so. A rigid diaphragm is mostly going to not deform as it responds and transfers those uh, forces. It may displace, but it won't have much of a uh, change in shape. That would be typical of many uh, concrete floor systems, which of course is what you have in most commercial buildings. Right? Some steel uh, floor systems will also look like that, but if you have a timber um, system for the floor system and therefore for the diaphragm, it's far more likely that you're going to have what's called a flexible one, where now the shape of the diaphragm is going to change. Right? Now, uh, before I get into a little bit more of that, big picture here, the rigid diaphragm is going to transfer forces according to the relative stiffness of the vertical elements, whether they be the shear walls or the brace frames or whatever. If these um, vertical systems are identical to each other in all kinds of really important ways that we'll talk about another time, then um, that will that will alter how the, this this sort of beam responds and then transfers the forces. Whereas in the case where we have a flexible diaphragm, then the diaphragm is going to operate as though it's a simply supported beam. And so WL over two going to each side is going to be the way you would model multiple uh, spans. Now, how do you know if it's a flexible or a rigid diaphragm? Uh, there's a variety of different kinds of definitions out there, but the base one is that if you compare how much the diaphragm itself flexes compared to how much offset you get from just the uh, drift of the vertical pieces, and you compare those two, well, if the diaphragm deflection is more than twice the, the average coming from the uh, drift of the vertical elements, then you'd say that that's a a flexible diaphragm, otherwise it's acting or behaving more like a rigid one. Again, typically um, steel and concrete would tend to be on the rigid side of diaphragms versus the timber would tend to be usually on the flexible side. Caveat to that is that uh, depends on how you've made your steel diaphragm. Um, it's quite possible that could also be uh, a flexible, and this is how the kind of calculation that you would know. Now, with the rigid ones, one of the things you got to be really careful about is not only how do you distribute the forces according to relative stiffness, but also eccentricity that that may be here. So we see here a floor plan of a typical um, one-story commercial type building. Here's your storefront, and of course the storefront being usually glass, then that can't be a shear wall. So you have shear walls now that go around most, but not all of the whole area. Uh, and when you're looking here in floor plan, the center of rigidity, 
is going to be way shifted off from, say, maybe the center of the area. Whereas this resultant force, um, typically even if it's a seismic, but especially if it's, it's wind, will be an, modeled as a relatively uniform force, and its centroid might be right through the geometric pl uh, plan or centroid of the plan, and we're going to have this eccentricity. And now that's going to create torsion as that set of forces wants to pass through and the system is trying to uh, resist it. So you don't tend to have to have that or deal with that problem in um, flexible diaphragms, but rigid ones you absolutely do have to be uh, concerned about that. Right? And so one last little sort of view of all this on this load path here is now we've got sort of a nicer three-dimensional view of the building. Just as a quick review, we've got these lateral forces. Uh, this is really showing uh, wind pressures. The vertical studs in the wall then will act as simple beams, transferring effects up to uh, both up and to the bottom of that uh, vertical beam. And if you have your foundation down here at the bottom, well, then part of that load is tributary load is going to go right in the foundation. But the other part has to go up, and then the diaphragm spreads it through its own sort of simple beam action in a horizontal plane to the shear walls or to the um, whatever the vertical elements are. And then that takes it back down to the uh, foundation. So this upper tributary area has to go up sideways and then back down whereas the lower tributary area will go straight down to the foundation.